in this video we'll be looking at paternity testing and genetic links so under paternity testing you need to know how blood grouping is used as well as DNA profiles and this should not be strange to you using DNA profiles because we actually looked at them when we were busy with the chapter of DNA in class now last year in the final paper paper 2 specifically they asked an essay question with regards to paternity testing now in that question they asked about sex determination so how the X and the Y chromosome is used in determining sex and then they asked paternity testing using blood grouping and DNA profiling now the theory that you will see in this video is actually taken from the memo of that paper because I think it is good for you guys to see what they expect of you so let's quickly run through how blood grouping is used for paternity testing so the blood group of a child is determined by the alleles received from both parents that should not be strange to you as you know that if a child is for example blood group AB just to make it nice and easy then the child would have received one allele from the one parent and then the other allele from the other parent so now the blood group of the mother the child and the possible father are determined if the blood group of the mother and the possible father cannot lead to the blood group of the child the man is not the father but if the blood group of the mother and the possible father can lead to the blood group of the child very important the man might be the father so he could be a possible father and the reason for that is this blood grouping is not conclusive because many men have the same blood group so that is why it's it's like a quick elimination test but it is not conclusive if they want to um, further their their inquiry I would suggest a DNA profile to be done so let's look at why um, or let's look at an example rather so if a, if a child is blood group O so if the child looks like that then a possible father with blood group A B is eliminated why because he does not carry the recessive allele that blood group O has now remember the child receives one allele from the mom and one allele from the dad does this father carry a recessive allele no if you need to see this let's quickly do it in a genetic cross using a Punnett square to quickly um, look if we can see what the possible outcomes would be so let's say the mother is blood group A and she's heterozygous for blood group A because she carries the recessive allele for blood group O so the child still has a chance um, of receiving that recessive allele from the mother but let's look why this father is not the father so if these two parents were to reproduce they would not reproduce a child with blood group O and there we can see it so there's no blood group O being um, made here if he is homozygous for blood group A or B he is also eliminated so that means if his blood group looks like that or that once again because there is no recessive allele that can be passed on but if a father uh, that is heterozygous for blood group A or B he could then be the possible father so that means if his blood actually looked like this I'm going to do one of them because these are basically technically the same with a genetic cross it just depends on whether it's A or B and then I'm going to use the mother as an example again um, using that so let's say the father also looks like that let's quickly cross them and see what the outcomes would be and there we can see that if he is heterozygous he could be the possible father because a blood group O is produced so I hope that makes sense it's really not that complicated you just need to keep track of what's going on then looking at DNA profiling once again this is from the memo 
So a child receives DNA from both parents. We know that already. The DNA profiles of the mother, the child, and the possible father are determined. Um, once it, it is very important that you mention um, all three of these people that are involved. Same with the, the blood grouping. Um, very important that you mention um, all three once again there. A comparison of the DNA bands of the mother and the child is made. The remaining DNA bands are compared to the possible father's DNA bands and if all the remaining DNA bands in the child's profile match the possible father's DNA bands, then the possible father is the biological father. Can you see the difference in uh, terms used here? Here they are very specific and they say that he is the biological father. Whereas with blood grouping, they say that he might be the father. So DNA profiling is much more specific with the outcomes. Now, if all the remaining DNA bands in the child's profile do not match the possible father's DNA bands, he is not the biological father. Now, looking at an example again, um, let's quickly run through this. I'm going to do it in red so you can see what is happening. So remember, now you need to cross out all of the mother and the child's DNA bands. Um, you need to compare them. And what I suggest, just take a pencil and just scratch it out so you know not to compare it with any of uh, the possible fathers. Uh, also suggest using a ruler when you are busy with this. So everywhere where the mom and the child is the same, just cross it out. Um, so it would take out that father, the DNA bands over there as well. Okay, now we can compare the remaining DNA bands with these three possible fathers. So let's see. Compares with that guy and that guy. And then the one that checks off the most is the possible father. So in this case, dad three is the possible father. But once, like I said, we we did this when we did DNA, so this should not be too difficult. I'm not going to spend much time on that. Let's move on to genetic links and see what that is all about. Okay, genetic links. You need to know mutations in the mitochondrial DNA are used in tracing female ancestry. So what is mitochondrial DNA? When we were busy with DNA, there was um, some theory that asked where do we find DNA in the human body? And the answer was in the chromosome and then in the mitochondria. So now you are finally going to see, um, you're going to, we're going to look at this mitochondria and where the mitochondrial DNA is used. So mitochondrial DNA, also known as mtDNA, is found in the mitochondria. So if you forgot what the mitochondria looks like, that is the mitochondria over there. It is circular in shape. So this is mitochondrial DNA, circular in shape. It is not a double helix structure like chromosomal DNA. And then what does it do? What does it do? Excuse me, it is responsible for the enzymes that function during cellular respiration. But what else can we do with mitochondrial DNA? So it is actually used in tracing genetic links. Now, how, did, how is that possible? So male sperm contain mitochondria in their tails, which are shed during fertilization. As soon as they, they reach the ovum, that little tail um, is shed. The rest of the remaining mitochondria is destroyed by the ovum. So as soon as that sperm head is inside the ovum, um, the mitochondrial DNA that is in there is completely destroyed. And thus all the mitochondria that remain are from the ovum and only inherited from the mother. So the only person that gives you mitochondrial DNA is from your mother. 
mtDNA is used to compare how closely related individuals are from each other. And if the mtDNA is very similar, it, it means that you're more closely related. So that means that you and your siblings, whether it be your brother, your sister, uh, you all share the same, exact same mitochondrial DNA as your mother. And your mother sh shares the exact same mitochondrial DNA as her mother and her grandmother and her great-grandmother. And what is actually interesting is that we can take the mitochondrial DNA and we can trace it back to a mitochondrial ease. So this is a reconstructed version of what they think mitochondrial Eve looked like. She actually was from Africa and then she lived around 200,000 years ago. But this does not mean that she was the first ever female to live on earth. Uh, she was even not the first of our species, the first female of our species. It's just that um, the other women that, were, that lived before her just didn't pass on their mitochondrial DNA. Now, another interesting thing, and you guys really don't need, this is just for interest sake. Um, another interesting thing is that the Y chromosome uh, can also be traced back and we can find, um, they call him a Y chromosomal Adam. So the f they, they've basically taken all of the Y chromosomes um, of all the men and they've traced it back to this guy which is of single origin and the reason why they can do that is because mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome um, don't recombine with any cr other chromosomes. Remember the X and the Y chromosome, the Y chromosome is very small so it doesn't um, cross over with the X chromosome during prophase and then mitochondrial DNA also doesn't go through that so it stays the same there's no genetic variation with it and that is why we are able to use it now I recently watched the video and I actually put it down in the description tab a link for that video um, where they have found that in some cases uh, mitochondrial DNA is actually transferred from the father. Now there's still a lot of research that has to happen uh, with regards to that but they suspect that around um, one in five thousand births that that actually happens where mitochondrial DNA is um, transferred or inherited from both parents and that might be like a little a genetic mutation that is occurring um, where the ovum does not destroy that mitochondrial DNA from the father's sperm. And that is the end of genetics and inheritance. We are done with the chapter and next we are going to look at uh, the brain, the eye, some very interesting things, but that is the end of this specific chapter. Mm -hmm.